Hi guys, Justin here from chemistrynotes.com and today we're continuing with uh, hybridization and hybrid orbitals and it, at the end of the last video we talked about sp3 hybridization and today we're going to continue with sp2 hybridization then sp hybridization then dsp3 and then finally d2 sp3 hybridization so sp2 hybridization is often used when you have double bonds or triple bonds um, is an example. The example we used for the sp3 was the tetrahedral CH4. The example we're using for sp2 hybridization is C2H4. So we'll use ethylene as an example. You count up all the valence electrons, you come up with the Lewis structure, you make sure you got 12 electrons at the end. We talked about this in section 8. So each carbon is surrounded by three effective pairs. If you just look at the carbon on the left, who is he attached to or who is he surrounded by? Two H's and then one carbon. Never mind that it's a double bond to the carbon, okay? It's one effective pair. As before, an isolated carbon, if it were just a freestanding carbon atom all on its own, it has the uh, electron configuration 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. And we'll ignore the 1s because it's not in the it's not a valence orbital. So the 2s and the 2p are the valence orbitals that we have. Those are the ones that we're going to mix together to make the hybrid orbitals. Now we need hybrid orbitals. We have to have three um, identical ways of attaching carbon to the hydrogen, to the hydrogen, and then to the double bond carbon. Okay. Now. SP3 orbitals won't work because they're tetrahedral. We learned in the last video that SP3 orbitals are when we have four effective pairs with, well, if they're all atoms with 109.5 bond angles. So what are we going to do? We're going to have to mix. We've got to take our 2s atomic orbital and we have our three 2p atomic orbitals. So this this column I'm drawing on this energy diagram looks just like it did for sp3 because it's just an isolated carbon atom like it was in my sp3 example. Except the way I hybridize is going to be much different because I don't want to use the s and all three of the p's to make an sp3 hybrid orbitals. I just want to use two. Okay, So I'm going to have one 2p orbital remaining or one 2p atomic orbital left over that I don't use. So I've taken the 2s and two of the 2p orbitals, hybridized them or mixed them together to make three equivalent sp2 hybrid orbitals. Okay, so the sp2 hybrid orbitals are made from 1s and 2p orbitals. Okay, so the carbon, uh, the, the carbon hybrid orbitals in C2H4 are the column you see to the right of that double arrow hybridization. Now, remember, in this molecule, we have two carbons, and they're both identical, so they're both doing this hybridization, okay? So, how are we going to draw something like this? Well, before I draw out the kind of the schematic or the sketch of the way this whole thing looks, I just want to mention that the three sp2 orbitals, all right, these are hybrid orbitals, okay? They are the result of me mixing an s atomic orbital with two atomic orbitals okay those three sp2 sp2 orbitals are going to be used to share electrons in an area centered on a line running between the two carbons so it's kind of like an internuclear line like if these are my two nuclei it's an internuclear line okay and anytime it's directly between the nucleus as opposed to say above and below uh, th these are called sigma bonds okay so this is a new idea now, we had sigma bonds in the CH4 example. I just didn't talk about it because in this example, we also have something called pi bonds, which I need to talk about in just a second. So if I begin this sketch, I got my two carbons, and then they are making a sigma bond or a single bond with their uh, respective sp2 orbitals. Okay, so each carbon has three sp2 orbitals. And on the outside, we have our hydrogens bonded together. Well, the hydrogen is bonding to a carbon through a 1s atomic orbital interacting with an sp2 hybrid orbital. Okay, and I've got my little electrons in between. 
Now, what are these shaded ones? Well, the shaded ones, because remember, this is a carbon-carbon double bond. A carbon-carbon double bond is one sigma bond and one pi bond. So what the heck is a pi bond? I'm going to define it for you in just a second. But it looks like we are using those leftover uh, atomic orbitals that we didn't use, the 2p. Remember how we had a leftover 2p atomic orbital? Well, that's the case with each carbon, right? So they can then have another... Uh, we can have another bond or the double bond part above and below the uh, internuclear axis, if you will. So let me finish labeling everything up. I've got my hydrogen labeled with their 1s because they're atomic orbitals. And it says here on the right, on the outside there, it says the second bond between the two carbon atoms, in other words, the double bond, res results from sharing an electron pair using the two... 2p atomic orbitals. Remember we had leftover 2p atomic orbitals. So the second bond between the two carbon atoms, double bond, results from sharing an electron pair using the two 2p atomic orbitals that are perpendicular to the three sp2 orbitals on each carbon. So you see how each carbon has it, those three lobes coming out of it, those sp2. Imagine those are kind of like going like this, the two p orbitals would be perpendicular to it, okay? Now, they're parallel to each other, but they're, partic they're perpendicular to the plane that has all the sp2 orbitals in it, all six of them. So these parallel p orbitals, all right, they look like dumbbells, right? These uh, parallel p orbitals can share an electron pair, which occupies the space above and below a line joining the carbon atoms together. So sigma bond is directly inter the, on the line that's in between the two nuclei. Okay, that's a single bond, if you will. And the pi bond is usually your double bond if you have two pi bonds and you have a double and a triple bond. And we'll see that in our next example. So just to reiterate, these parallel p orbitals can share an electron pair, which occupies the space above and below a line joining the carbon atoms to form a pi bond. So in C2H4, there are five sigma bonds, and there are one, and there is one pi bond. All right, let's move on to our third hybridization. We've talked about sp3 hybridization. We just talked about sp2 hybridization, and now we're going to talk about sp hybridization. So this is used when an atom in a molecule has only two effective pairs attached to it, if you will. Now, why don't I call that two atoms? Well, because an effective pair can also be a lone pair, okay? So, sp hybridization is used when an atom in a molecule has only two effective pairs around it. In the example that I'm going to do below, carbon is going to have to become sp hybridized. hybridized. So let's take a look at the example. This is carbon dioxide. I've just given its Lewis structure. We've already learned how to draw Lewis structures. So if I look at my carbon, he's got two attachments. He's got two effective pairs to it. So I'm going to want to have two ways to bond identically to each of those uh, oxygen uh, exterior atoms. To do that, see, I'm drawing like I always do, my freestanding carbon with its atomic orbitals. The 2s and the 2p are the valence atomic orbitals, I'm going to hybridize into an sp, uh, into two sp orbitals. Now what that means is I only took one of the p orbital, p atomic orbitals, so I've got two leftover atomic orbitals that are going to be lying around, and I'm going to need those to make my double bonds. So on the right hand column there, you've got your sp, which are my new hybrid orbitals made from 1s and 1p atomic orbital. And then I got my leftover or my remaining 2p atomic orbitals that I can use as needed. Okay, so just a note here, if you look at the oxygens and you go around them, you can see they're sp1, p2. Uh, each of those oxygens are sp2 hybridized. And that means that they're going to have three sp2 orbitals coming off of them. And I'm going to show you that on the next page when I draw the big sketch. Okay, so just to let you guys know, you can also do the hybridization around the uh, 
atoms on the outside. It doesn't just have to be the central atom. But each oxygen has three effective pairs, right? It's got one carbon attached to it, and then it's got two lone pairs. All right, so I'm going to try to draw this. I got my oxygen, and then I got my carbon in the middle, and then I got my oxygen on the right, don't I? Now those lobes look the same, but they're different. Oxygen we just discussed has sp2 orbitals. That's why you see three of them. Okay, and I got my lone pairs out there in those sp2 orbitals. One of the sp2 orbitals is crossing over and interacting with my carbon sp orbital. And then on the right-hand side, we're seeing the identical, um, the identical structure. The carbon's sp orbital is going to interact with oxygen's sp2 orbital, right? And then the oxygen is going to have uh, the outer sp2 orbitals are going to contain the lone pairs. Now, carbon has two 2p orbitals. So I've kind of made one kind of a kind of crossing like that. I tried to sketch one out to make them look different. But carbon has two 2p orbitals available to make multiple bonds. We just did an example. Previously, where the oxygen in this case is kind of like the carbon in the last example, he's only got one p orbital. So if you see how this all crosses over, we can see how the carbon in the center has two p orbitals, and they're each making pi bonds with the opposite oxygens on either side. Okay, so this is my sketch of a localized electron model for CO2. And uh, if you'd like to check your textbook or maybe Google localized electron model CO2, you can see all the different colors they tend to use. But um, this is a very good sketch here that shows you the two p orbitals on carbon are perpendicular to each other and they're interacting with the, um, with the properly aligned p orbitals on either oxygen. All right, so just one more bullet point here I want to write down is that the carbon oxygen double bonds each consist of one sigma bond and one pi bond. So that's just like the carbon-carbon double bond that we did in our previous example, right? Anytime you have a double bond, it's one sigma bond and one pi bond, all right? So now let's move on to DSP3 hybridization. For the DSP3 hybridization and the D2SP3 hybridization, I'm gonna go over these ones a little bit, uh, a little bit more quickly. I like to focus on the SP3, the SP2, and the SP, those are the ones that you're normally required to really know how to sketch and to draw a localized electron model for. But DSP3 hybridization is used when the atom requires five effective pairs around it um, in a molecule. So examples of central atoms that like to make five are phosphorus, P, and arsenic, AS is another one. So in PCL5, the Lewis structure I've drawn there, you just have five chlorines around the, the phosphorus. And so just a general statement now about DSP3 hybridization. A set of five effective pairs around an atom, such as phosphorus or arsenic is another one that likes to make five effective pairs, AS. A set of five effective pairs around an atom, such as phosphorus in my example, requires a trigonal bipyramidal arrangement, okay? Now we discussed bi trigonal bipyramidal in section eight in detail. A set of five effective pairs around an atom requires a trigonal bipyramidal arrangement and DSP3 hybridization. All right, so last one I wanna talk about is D2SP3 hybridization. If you add up all that, you got two, the one, this is gonna require six effective pairs. You got the two on the D, S is an unwritten one, P is a three. So you're gonna have six of these D2SP3 hybrid orbitals, okay? So SF6 is octahedral. How do we uh, have an octahedral? How are we gonna have six effective uh, lobes that will interact with fluorines identically? Well, we have to manipulate our atomic orbitals into six D2SP3 hybrid orbitals. So we have six effective pairs around the central atom, and that is going to require an octahedral geometry and D2SP3 hybridization. Okay, 
Now I haven't drawn a localized electron model for DSP3 or for D2SP3, and I want and I've done it on purpose. I just want you guys to know how to draw the localized electron model for SP3, SP2, and SP. All right. Uh, just one last note there at the bottom: each of the six D2SP3 orbitals is used by sulfur to bond to a fluorine atom. All right, so that's it for the localized electron model, and uh, we're done with that part of section nine. And uh, the next video, we're going to talk about entirely new stuff for section nine. Okay, all right.